I've spent so long setting up that this is it's not as hot as it should be, but I also kind of wish it was coffee, but I don't have any coffee, so oh well. Hello cinnamon bun, happy Preptober! Welcome to the first video for Preptober 2017. I'm pretty excited to be here. Um, I'm pretty excited to do this video as well. Um, I feel like it's, it's an important one. Remember and stay to the end as well because I am going to tell you all about my new plot embryo template printable. So yeah, this is this is another plot embryo video. I'm sorry guys, I've just, I'm such a convert. I can't, I can't stop myself. It's just, it's changed my life. It's magical. It's my cult now. So with the normal plot embryo structure, the eight point circle, there's a lot of different kinds of stories you can do with that. You can do everything from, you know, a classic, heroic, traditional story, which ends in the obligatory marriage. Or you can do something a lot more subtle, modern, with a lot more of a realistic or a bittersweet ending. Um, and all of those fit in to the plot embryo. But what about characters that don't get happy endings? So what about antagonists? What about villains? What about tragedy? Well, that's what this whole video is going to be about. The tragic plot embryo. And again, you're going to have a whole spectrum here from, you know, the villains who are pure evil at their core and must die at the end, um, to, you know, antagonists who are misguided but quite likeable and probably just need to learn their lesson. Some writers are really good at antagonists and historically, that's not been me, I'm gonna be honest. Um, I am, like, I studied ethics, and um, it was what I specialised in when I did philosophy and stuff, so I have very strong feelings about morality, and even though rationally I know that, like, there's a grey area and things are complicated, I find it very difficult not to just categorise people and things as either good or bad. Like, my brain just tends towards being very black and white, and so this makes it difficult for me as a writer to, on the one hand, have my heroes be flawed, make them make mistakes, make them take risks and stuff because I'm worried that they're going to be unlikable and it's going to make them bad. Um, and then on the flip side with my antagonists, I find it difficult to give them humanising qualities and get you to root for them even if you hate them as well. Um, and the tragic plot embryo has been a game changer for me. I mean the plot embryo was already a game changer but I have used this to create some of my favourite characters uh, that I've ever written um, and create some really heart-wrenching antagonists who, who really like had an emotional impact on me and stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I love this technique and I'm really excited to share it with you. So in terms of how I'm going to break up this video, I'm going to start with the quadrants of the tragic embryo and then the plot points of the tragic embryo. And then I'm going to break down a tragic plot, um, one that you are probably going to know, um, and fit it into the embryo and show you how that works, sort of a demonstration, if you will. Okay, so the quadrants, the internal and external realms of the story. Um, Side note, I know that quadrant is not the right word for this because quadrant implies four, which implies it's a quarter, and these are halves, like, they're semicircles, but they also overlap, so there's like four halves, which doesn't make sense. Um, so I know that quadrant doesn't exactly make sense for this phrase, but um, I hate saying semicircles, it sounds stupid. So I'm just gonna call them quadrants anyway, so like, just in case you were nitpicking about that. Know that I know, and I don't care. So for the tragic embryo, this is basically the same as the heroic embryo. Um, so on the top you've got the familiar, and the bottom you've got the unfamiliar, on the top you've got the comfort zone, and on the bottom you have the world of the unknown, order and chaos, life and death. Um, that's basically the same, so... The internal realm, however, is different, and this is because what is the difference between a heroic embryo and a tragic embryo? Happy ending. Tragedy ends in sadness. That's the whole point of it. So um, you remove those last two plot points. So no happy ending means removing the top quarter of the embryo. And that doesn't just mean the plot points, it means the part of that quadrant too. So for the tragic embryo, I like to characterise the internal realm quadrants as, on the right, the fatal flaw instead of, well, I mean, it's just a form of ignorance or false belief. Um, and on the left, you have the half quadrant, and that is insufficient realisation. So the fatal flaw has to be the thing about this character which will be their downfall. That might be a false belief, a twisted worldview, or some other kind of dysfunction that will backfire on them eventually. 
the insufficient realisation will be a change, a kind of enlightenment, realisation of their fatal flaw, but it's not going to be the same transformative um, effect that the hero gets, so it's not going to be enough to save them, to push them through all the way to a happy ending. So the heroic embryo has eight plot points, the tragic embryo doesn't get a happy ending, so you remove two of them, which means it has six plot points. Now you can use the exact same names for these plot points as the heroic embryo, um, I find in that sort of same way that I'm always saying different words make your brain do different things, I like to call them different things just to kind of um, hit home in my head that this is a tragic embryo and they are slightly different. So the names I find that I am using for the plot points of the tragic embryo um, actually came from some research I did on tragic structure and it came from a blog post so you might find them familiar, I'm sure they've been around elsewhere. So at number one you've got you and I am increasingly also thinking of this just as backstory. Who was the character before they went bad? What made them who they are? So I am actually going to be doing a whole video on this plot point, on this backstory, you, zone of comfort stuff. Um, but briefly, what kind of life have they had that has led them to having the fatal flaw in the right quadrant? So what taught them that violence was the best way to get what they want, or that muggles aren't as good as wizards, or whatever fucked up thing they believe? Again, like the hero though, they're in a zone of comfort here. At two, you've got need or anticipation. You could also call this the motive goal. So they're in a zone of comfort, but they want something. Okay, so it's important to get specific here. Why the character wants the thing they want should be informed by their backstory. So if they want magical powers, to do what? If they want money, to spend it on what? If they want to be loved or respected, by who? So this is where you want to build empathy for the character, even if later you're going to rip it all away. This is where they need to be the most relatable. We should care about what they want and why they want it, even if it's not something that we could ever personally imagine wanting. If you don't get the reader rooting for them here, it's not going to have any emotional punch later on when they lose it all and when things ultimately end badly. So how likeable the character is and how much you want the reader to root for them is obviously a spectrum. You've got pure evil with like maybe one redeeming quality on the one side and then you have you know people that are mostly likeable but have done maybe one terrible thing. But whether or not you sprinkle in other likeable moments elsewhere, they absolutely must have one here. So at point three, you have goal or dream. So this is where they set off in search of their motive goal. And if they end up truly evil in the end, then this is kind of where they set off down the path of evil. So this is a really good place to have them do something that's maybe not outright bad, but throws up a bit of a red flag that maybe makes the reader a little bit uneasy the character is so focused on what they want that they maybe do something a little bit questionable on the way to getting it. And then you have point four, search or frustration. So here they encounter real obstacles. And if this character is the antagonist of another story, um, rather than just a tragic standalone story, this is where they're going to clash with the protagonist and the heroes where those meddling kids try and mess up their plan. The character will be forced to take serious action in pursuit of their motive goal and will commit dark acts from which there is no going back. You should want the character to get what they need, which might not necessarily be what they want, but you should find their tactics unforgivable. Okay, hello again. Um, my phone had a little bit of a vid life crisis um, while I was filming there, so I've had to set up again. Um, I'm using Ross's phone. <laughs> Um, and yeah, so apologies if it looks a little bit different. Um, I have a new cup of tea though, so let's try and continue. So I'm gonna pause for a second on this plot point and give you two tips for creating villains and actions for those villains to take that create a visceral kind of like reaction in your reader. So you want them to be like, oh God, I can't believe you did that. Or, oh my God, I hate that you did that. So I have two tips. One, you have to have them do something personally despicable to someone that we, care about. We, as in the reader. You can't just use a red shirt here. We don't care what characters we know do to characters that we don't know. We don't care what they do off stage, basically. So when you want them to do something bad, it has to hurt an existing major character that we already care about. Or if you are going to use a red shirt, you need to at least put in enough work that we care about the red shirt before that thing happens to them. Tip number two, try and focus on small, sharp wrongs instead of trying to convey evil by sheer volume. Killing a thousand people that we can't see or comprehend while objectively more evil still feels less evil than watching someone kick a puppy right in front of us. 
One of those has a more visceral reaction and it's because it's happening immediately in front of us to something that we have obviously seen and developed an attachment to very quickly. At point five, you have find or nightmare. So the character's plans unravel and opposing forces close in, rendering them paranoid and desperate. If this is the plot embryo of an antagonist for your main story, then the opposing force will be your protagonist. They do meet the goddess here. They do, in some way, shape or form, get what they originally wanted, but they may realize that they can't enjoy it because of everything awful they did to get here. Meeting the goddess is where they find the elixir, the thing they were searching for. After that, it's about what they decide to do with it. Meeting the goddess is a revelation, it's new information, it's a twist, and it can make them see their fatal flaw in a new light, but it won't have that same transformative effect that it has on the hero. It may appear as this kind of redemptive flicker of humanity, but it won't be enough to save them. And you can see there are parallels with the heroic embryo. Meeting the goddess is always a moment of revelation, of change, of the kind of reveal of the true state of things, the hero didn't properly comprehend before. Um, except for the hero, this is going to be like, oh shit, I was wrong, and that's going to like empower them to change and to you know blast through the the rest of the story to return to the familiar world with a villain or an antagonist um, or a tragic character at this point you, they're going to find out they're wrong and it is going to crumble their world like it's like oh shit i've been wrong this whole time and i did all these awful things under that false impression and finally we have take or destruction so the price of achieving their goal is too high but they pay it anyway. They get the opposite of what they wanted. Destruction can mean death, but it can also just mean the destruction of their dream. So if they wanted money, they end up poor. If they wanted power, they end up weak. Um, if they want to win, they end up losing. Um, this is the part that makes it a sad story. They lose, either at their own hand or at the hands of enemies, who may be your heroes. And the story ends here. They can't escape the consequences of their actions, especially the actions in plot point four. They can't escape the world of the unknown, the unfamiliar realm, to return and change. They're stuck there forever and they gotta pay the price. Okay, now I'm gonna break down an example of a tragic plot for you. And I'm gonna go with a very well-known example um, because we can't seem to escape Star Wars when we talk about plot embryos. Um, and yeah, so I'm gonna do Darth Vader. But here's my personal take on it. The external realms for Darth Vader's story are Jedi on the top and Sith on the bottom. And I would characterize his internal realm as being his attraction to the dark side and the love for family. And he darts between these like a lot. Like it's obviously like a constant struggle. It's not just like struggles against the dark side. Oh, he loves his family. Like he bounces between these. Now, because Star Wars is a saga, it means it's really big and long. Um, I actually found there are quite a lot of duplicate sort of scenes, not duplicate in that they're the same, but they perform the same function in the plot embryo structure. So this is me reducing everything down to the points of Anakin slash Vader's personal arc and basically ignoring all the like broader rebels versus empire stuff. So in The Phantom Menace, we have plot point one, you. Anakin is a young slave on Tatooine, gifted and has potential as a Jedi. He forms a bond with Padme Amidala. Qui-Gon Jinn asks for permission to train Anakin as a Jedi, but the Council sense fear in him and refuse. After he's killed, Obi-Wan promises to train Anakin. So the Phantom Menace is all like establishing, it's all set up, it's all backstory. In Attack of the Clones, we have anticipation. Anakin and Padme fall in love and marry in secret. Then we get to Revenge of the Sith. Anakin's now a Jedi Knight. Palpatine urges him to kill Dooku in cold blood, prepping him for the dark side. Anakin learns that Padme is pregnant and has visions of her giant dying in childbirth. He becomes determined to prevent them from coming true. So as far as I can tell, this is Anakin's motive goal, is to save Padme from dying in childbirth. And this only like appears in Revenge of the Sith. So no wonder those fucking previous movies are so boring. They're all plot point one, one of six. So Palpatine tells Anakin that the dark side holds the power to cheat death, aka he's like implying, hey, you could you could use the dark side of stuff to save your wife. So Anakin saves Palpatine and lets him kill Windu. So this is like a kind of, he has a choice between helping the Jedi and helping the Sith and he chooses a Sith. I'm desperate to save Padme. Anakin pledges himself to the dark side and becomes Palpatine's Sith apprentice, Darth Vader. Padme implores him to abandon the dark side, but he refuses. 
Paranoid she has been conspiring against him, he uses the force to choke her into unconsciousness in a fit of rage. Obi-Wan defeats him and he's horribly injured. Palpatine takes him back to Coruscant with his mutilated body is covered in the black armour and suit we all know and love. When Vader asks about Padme's whereabouts, Palpatine explains to him that he killed Padme in his anger. He screams in agony, his spirit broken. So that's the end of Revenge of the Sith. So frustration is the point where he does the awful thing from which there's no going back. And for Anakin that is killing Padme, killing his own wife, the one who he was trying to save. So after that he's fully committed to the dark side and the next thing we see is Star Wars. So Vader captures and tortures Princess Leia who has hidden the Death Star plans and during Leia's rescue Vader kills Obi-Wan in a lightsaber duel. Then Luke destroys the Death Star. So obviously the, the conflict here for Vader is um, Luke and Obi-Wan are getting all up in his shit and trying to fuck up his plans, which are, I don't know, kind of vague at this point. He just works for the Empire, I guess. Killing Obi-Wan could be considered another um, like point in that because it's another like kind of unforgivable thing from which you can't really go back. We move into five, Nightmare in the Empire Strikes Back. Um, so Vader defeats Luke, severing his hand. He tells Luke that he is his father and asks him to help him overthrow the Emperor. Horrified, Luke escapes through an air shaft. So at this point, Vader's kind of goal is to kind of reconnect with his family, but also like be super empire, yay. It's go it goes extremely wrong for him in that Luke refuses. Then in Return of the Jedi, we have realizing that Leia is Luke's twin sister, Vader threatens to turn her to the dark side if Luke will not submit. Furious, Luke overpowers Vader and severs his father's robotic hand. So I'm a little bit wobbly on this one, but I would say that the meeting the goddess moment for Vader is um, Luke's refusal to join him. That's the thing that starts to unravel all his plans. That's the thing that proves him wrong. Um, if we were to assume that he thinks that there is no fighting the dark side, that it's inevitable, that um, you know, like he had no choice in being sucked into it, Luke proves him wrong. Luke is saying, "Nah, I'm, I'm fine. I'm, I'm not." But to go into the dark side, thanks. It's not for me. I guess it proves to him if Luke can resist, then. Why couldn't he resist? The Emperor orders Luke to kill Vader and take his place. Luke refuses and the Emperor tortures him with force lightning. Moved by Luke's pleas for help, Vader throws the Emperor down the Death Star's reactor core to his death. He's mortally wounded by the lightning in the process. So this is that change. This is that little crossover into that little glimmer of enlightenment, little, little glimmer of change, this little flicker of redemption is. Um, he sees Luke in pain and he finally connects with that love for family that he used to have um, and really value and he chooses to save him. But we've seen him do far too many awful things to let him get a happy ending. It just wouldn't fit if he got better and just like sauntered off with Luke and celebrated with the rest of the rebels. Anakin Skywalker tells his son that he was right about there being good in him after all before he dies. At his funeral pyre, Anakin's spirit reunites with those of Obi-Wan and Yoda to watch over Luke and his friends as they celebrate the fall of the Empire. Okay, so that's how I would break it down anyway. Um, I hope it was kind of illuminating for you. Um, if you disagree about how to break that down, then feel free to leave comments below. What am I opening myself up to here? Just quickly before I go, because I have a suspicion this video is going to be very long, um, I have just created a printable plot embryo template. So I personally just refinished the final replotting of North of the End, and altogether I ended up with 10 plot embryos. Um, some of them are tragic and some of them are heroic. Um, I find it's it's really good if you are if you're struggling with some of the plot points of your um, your main plot embryo or your heroic embryo or your main character's embryo, um, do the villain. If there is an antagonist, if there is someone who, um, you know, it's not just like a force, it's really good to do the flip side and see it from the villain's or the antagonist's point of view. So like I said, I ended up with 10 for one novel um, and that's not even counting the ones that I did and didn't like or didn't work or just ended up not using. Um, so I had to redraw this whole thing um, and create my own template like quite a lot of times and it got a bit old <laughs> and it was quite time consuming. So I went to the trouble of creating a printable template for all of us so that we don't have to do that anymore. Um, it includes two reference sheets for the plot embryo, the heroic plot embryo and the tragic plot embryo, 
just like kind of reminders of the plot points and the quadrants um, to keep you know in your story bible or your binder or pin it above your desk and then it contains some templates as well so you can print off a tragic embryo or a heroic embryo um, and go straight into filling in plot points and quadrants and stuff instead of having to draw things out and measure them and use compasses or draw around a jar or whatever. And I will leave links to the plot embryo printable everywhere important. There will be a card probably up there, there will be a link in the description box. Um, I will tweet about it, it will be on my website, so go and find it and enjoy. I hope you're getting uh, your Preptober season off to a good start. As always, I'm Rachel Stephen, novelist, YouTuber, Woodland Halvich. This video is part of my series for Preptober. Preptober is a NaNoWriMo prep project which is committed to helping you outline and prep and do everything you need to do to have a fun NaNoWriMo that isn't going to give you a draft that sucks so bad you're going to have to spend five years revising it. I speak from experience. Um, so if you are interested in that, you should follow us on Twitter to join the conversation. That's where we have all the social chat. And if you want to make sure you don't miss out on any resources, you should join the email list, which will be, again, down below. So have fun. Happy October. Let's get started. I'm ready. I hope you're ready. Let's go. Bye. Seagulls, could you cool it, please? That's a bit excessive. Into an unconscious fit of rage. Force him to a pan to abandon to a panda realms for darth 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 then it fight <laughs> this is not making any sense rachel t t just watch me wait my nose enjoy this one is going in the kitchen with ross must <laughs> Violence is the best thing. The the, the bite the best. It's just the best thing. I I can't seem to just hold a thought and keep it in my hand and put it in my mouth and then regurgitate it at you. I can't. Mm. I never set my timer. Um. <laughs> so it's nice. It is nice to be here. To be back, guys. I'm excited. Happy. Happy October. Happy October. I hope you're, even if you're not noveling this year, you're following along with Preptober and helping cheer other people on. And if you are noveling this year, like, I hope you're excited about it. I'm excited for you. Okay, let's, let's try that again. Tagonist <laughs> and tangent. <laughs> ah, this is gonna take so long. Oh. That's pretty good. Play embryo. <laughs> it's like Terry's chocolate orange, but fake. So it's dairy fine. Orange miniatures milk. 